Okay, so uh, let us uh, let us uh, now uh, do the third paper, and please let me invite Dinesh our chef, who's going to be speaking to us. He said it's between theism and atheism, a Jain paradigm of God. Please. Um, thank you so much, uh, Professor Ustama, uh, for this kind introduction. And uh, I would also like to thank the organizers um, for inviting me to this conference and also for the paper incubator grant, uh, which uh, perhaps will enable me to develop this paper further and uh, result into uh, publication. So to begin with, I um, we'll begin with an introduction and followed by certain arguments which uh, goes against theism in the Jain context, as well as certain other arguments which are for theism, again, in the Jain context. And together, what emerges is a Jain paradigm, which is neither exclusively theistic nor atheistic. And... Uh, at the end, I'll just uh, try to discuss what implications does this have on some of the other problems uh, that we are concerned with. So, to begin with, um, these were the first set of questions that we find on uh, the conference web page uh, as part of the concept notes. And I'll try to see uh, and, and address these questions uh, in the Jain context um, and, and see where we can go from there. So, and, and these were some more questions which were related to the problem of consciousness and to explain it, which I'll just touch upon at the end. So, uh, is Jainism a theistic or an atheistic school? And this has been a question of debate and discussion since uh, quite a long period because Primarily, the historians of Indian philosophy have characterized Jainism as atheistic or Nastika. And these two terms also do not mean the same thing all, 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 all the time when they, whenever they are used, because sometimes these terms are used as conveying whether Vedas are accepted as authoritative or not. And at other times, they are about whether there exists a God or not. So Charvakas are considered as Nastikas, but Jains and Buddhists also sometimes are grouped together under what is known as heterodox. But these categories are no longer uh, fruitful, and Daya Krishna and many others have argued that many schools, for instance, Sankhya, do not accept God, but still is considered as Astika. Mimansakas and the Vedantins are the only ones who take Veda seriously. And so uh, the whole classification of Indian philosophy into these two uh, categories perhaps needs to be revisited. Um, there have been uh, 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 these discussions as well about whether it's appropriate to use the term God in the Jain context because the terms that they use are either Paramatma, uh, which could be translated as Supreme Soul, Parameshti, a technical Jain term for uh, uh, the five supreme beings that they talk about, Bhagavan, and many other such terms. But whether the term God fits into the Jaina context or not uh, is also something that can be debated. But uh, these are uh, uh, the individuals, the Jinnas, Arahantas, Tirthankaras, Siddhas, which can be considered as equivalent to what goes by the term God. Uh, and I quote, uh, literally, Siddhas are the one who has accomplished his goals, a term for a soul that has attained liberation from the cycle of rebirth, the void of a body, it experiences its own true nature of infinite consciousness and bliss, ananta, jnana, and sukha. It dwells forever in the Siddha Loka or Ishat Pragbara Bhumi, which is located just above the heavenly realms at the very top of the occupied universe, Loka Kasha. Supreme souls, Paramatman, and God, Deva, are other terms for a liberated soul. What I'm trying to argue over here is that following Anekanta Vada, which is translated as non-one-sidedness, ideally, the giant philosopher must be able to say 
that the Jaina worldview is neither exclusively theistic nor atheistic, and that it is both. So it is theistic in some sense and atheistic in some other. And this could be captured by the phrase Syat theism, Syat atheism. Syat is a quantifier that they use to predicate uh, and qualify sentences. In other terms, it is sui generis jatyantara, and this is one of the definitions of what is anekanta. So what is anekanta? Well, it is about being sui generis, being jatyantara, and denying the uh, extreme binaries. Anekanta is also defined as anything that exists is non-one-sided, and this includes uh, concepts and theories as well. Some of the sources that I uh, will be mainly uh, looking at are uh, texts by Samantha Bhadra and uh, Vidyanandan. Samantha Bhadra's Aapta Mimansa has a long commentarial tradition and it has been commented and sub-commented by uh, generations of scholars within the Jain uh, uh, tradition. So, uh, and, and, and each of the subsequent commentator incorporates the entire previous commentary and which is why uh, this this text has an appeal to not just uh, one sect of the Jainas, Bhikamvara or Shatamvara, and also uh, and it also appeals to the entire uh, history of Jain philosophy. Another text that I'll be also looking into is uh, Apta Pariksha, along with an author commentary again by Vidyanandan, um, and um, some of the sources that. Uh, discuss the, these topics and uh, Sharma's book, A Jain Perspective on the Philosophy of Religion, is perhaps uh, the best uh, introduction that I've come across so far. And it also does uh, discuss uh, some of the issues that I'm going to uh, talk about, but the text that I just mentioned uh, do not feature so much into the discussion, and which is what I'll be focusing on. Uh, some other sources and a very recent paper by Jeffrey Long uh, is also arguing for a similar thesis that I am arguing today. But again, uh, the texts are, are not primarily visible and also the arguments are not fully developed in, 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 in this paper. It, it was a more general account of the Jain view. And some other books which have gone to the other extreme and labeled Jainism as a theistic uh, philosophy. And um, uh, some more attempts which uh, have taken place, but amongst all, I think uh, Sharma's account uh, would be the starting point to uh, discuss Jainism vis-a-vis -vis philosophy of religion. Moving further, I'll now introduce the arguments which uh, go against uh, theism. And I'll deal with each of these individually. So Jainism denies the view that God is the creator of the universe. It denies that God is eternal. It also denies that there is a divine will or a divine grace. Uh, it also denies that God is one and that he uh, loves. Um, so starting with uh, the first one, there is no creator God. And it is this uh, axiom or a premise which perhaps enables Jains to uh, develop an altogether different paradigm of what a god should be. Because if the god is not the creator of the universe, then some problems such as how does something come out of nothing and some other questions do not arise at all. And also the question that how can a conscious being produce something that is non-conscious is also not uh, applicable here then. Uh, desire part, I, I'll discuss more on this again in some in some time, but uh, if the God creates the universe, then it means that uh, there was a desire to create one, and then it runs into some problems, because whether the desire is always present or whether it is temporary, if it is temporary, then infinite regress and so on. Uh, the problem of evil also is perhaps uh, dissolved here. Uh, and if God is not eternal, then, then how do you explain wh what exactly it is? I'll come to that again. Omnipotence, again, uh, is also not uh, applicable in the Jaina context. Also, they do talk about something like Ananta Virya, and uh, it's explained in terms of omniscience. So the potential to the, the, the very act of knowing everything uh, itself is an explication or an uh, instantiation of 
uh, omnipotency. Moving further, uh, the Jainas have argued that it's not possible for the God to be eternal and this non-eternality of the God, uh, uh, Vidyanandan take this, takes this up seriously. So the Jinnah or the Tirthankara is someone who becomes so. It is not possible, the Jains argue, to be a beginningless perfect entity, Anupaya Siddha. And it is so because if uh, Anupaya Siddha is granted, then destruction of karmas is not possible. In order to be or become God, he must destroy them at a given time t, and thus he has a beginning. Uh, the the Purva Paksha continues, he does not have a beginning, he is Sada Mukta, and thus does not need to destroy the karmas. He does not have a beginning because he is the cause of body, senses, world, etc. It is so because they are effects. These effects are such that they must be caused by an intellectual being. So the argument from cosmology, the argument from design and all those are included in the Purva Paksha. And then Vidyanandin continues. God cannot be uh, the creator of Tanu, Karana, Bhuvana, body, senses, and the world, etc. Because the beginninglessness cannot be validated by the Pramanas. And then he continues. The Hetu, uh, Buddhi, Karana, Janya, caused by intellectual being, does not share a relation of invariable concomitance with the effects such as body, etc. It is so because it is not possible to show that in some place and in some time, there is non-existence of the effects such as body, etc. For the Ishwara is supposed to be all-pervasive across space and time. So if the Ishwara is present and it's all-pervasive across space and time, then the effects should continue to be produced all the time. And if it is said that uh, it is the desire that regulates uh, the creation and that these objects need not be produced every single moment, then the Jainas ask, is that desire itself eternal or non-eternal? If eternal, then again the effects must continue to be produced all the time. If non-eternal, then we need another desire to bring into uh, existence this particular one and then infinite regress. Again, uh, further, uh, there is an absence of divine will, divine grace. So in a way, the God that the Jainas think of does not interact as such with the world. And yet, um, uh, I'll come to the worship part later. And this is mainly what uh, the Shramanas uh, believed in. And, and the Jains and the Buddhists both shared this axiom that liberation is something that one will attain via one's own efforts. And one doesn't have to uh, rely on divine uh, help or, or, or graces. Further, the Jainas also uh, argue that the God is devoid of love and compassion. And this is something that was interesting when I first read because, and, and the Buddhist is the, the Buddhist, uh, the Buddhists are the interlocutors. And the question is that if the God or the Jinnah doesn't have compassion or karuna, how does he help in the elimination of suffering? And uh, then the, the, the argument is that um, elimination of suffering can happen even without that love or compassion. For example, a lamp that destroys darkness. And through his teachings, the jinnah is a moral exemplar and perhaps continues uh, to inspire. So it is the teachings that help in the elimination of suffering. And apart from that, karuna is considered to be a, a symbol of moha, of attachment. And it's considered to be um, negative. Moving further, now, uh, what, what exactly are the elements that help uh, one to arrive at a Jaina view of theism? And I'll start with the argument for perfect being. And Samantha Bhadra in Apta Mimansa, this is somewhere around 4th, 5th century. And it was interesting to see that the argument from gradation features here, which is something that Equinus also talks about. But Equinus doesn't talk about God as someone who becomes, whereas the Jainas are interested in trying to argue that via gradation, it is possible to achieve a state where one is perfect, uh, morally perfect, and there are no further imperfections that remain. So uh, the Karika goes, I'll just re uh, read out the translation. In some individuals, there exists complete destruction of imperfections and wills, uh, avaranas and doshas. 
for given any absence of imperfections, there is something which exceeds it, atishayana. For example, complete removal of external and internal impurities of a substance like gold ore is possible on the availability of appropriate means. And further, the Jains also argue uh, very rigidly and rigorously for omniscience. And perhaps, uh, I'm not sure, but someone might correct me that uh, within Indian philosophy, which are the ones, which philosophers have argued for omniscience uh, in the earliest period? And I would be uh, interested to discuss this further. So, um, uh, and there is an entire debate going on with the Buddhists, with the Mimansaka. So Dharma Kirti says like, what importance to us is the knowledge of the number of insects and why does the Ishvara has to know everything? Why does, doesn't it just suffice with the knowledge of Heya Upadeya, that which is to be discarded, that which is to be acquired and everything else is just uh, irrelevant. Mimansakas also again argue that uh, omniscience is not possible at all in a human being, and this is mainly because they wanted to retain that the Vedas are authorless. So, for the infallibility of the Vedas, uh, omniscience was denied to uh, human beings or any being as such. Kumarila uh, in Shloka Vartika develops these arguments against the Jainas, the Buddhists. But uh, this has all uh, been discussed quite uh, in detail, and this was uh, in Ramji Singh's book, uh, The Jaina Concept of Omniscience, which is quite interesting. And it, it surveys all the debates and the arguments from the Jaina side as well. I'll move further. And uh, this is uh, perhaps uh, in, within the Jain tradition, this is perhaps the first argument that establishes omniscience. Um, and the argument goes. Uh, the objects which are minuscule, concealed, or remote are known directly by someone because they are objects of inference, like fire, etc. And I'll just uh, put out the argument in the traditional Indian uh, Anumana uh, style. So the Pratigya is that direct perception of sukshma, suchal, concealed, or remote, uh, which are remote spatially spe or temporarily. Uh, so this direct perception of objects is possible. The Hetu, because they are objects of inference, all objects of inference are objects of direct perception and that which cannot be directly perceived can also not be an object of inference. So there is an invariable concomitance that uh, Samantha Bhadra tries to argue for. And since these are objects of inference, they must be perceived directly by someone. And if I... Uh, add the gradation argument to this one because these karikas are just one after the other. This was the fifth one, that one was the fourth. And then uh, by someone, and, and if I introduce the degrees in terms of direct perception, there must be someone who will have a full potential realized and would be able to uh, directly perceive everything uh, simultaneously. Again, uh, the, the Samantha Bhadra argues for the Jinnah to be an authoritative teacher, Aapta. <laughs> and uh, he says that you alone are the perfect being for your teachings are uncontradicted by reason and scripture. Uh, by scripture, it means like there is no uh, Purva Para Virodha, that his, he doesn't contradict himself. And uh, so Nirdosha, the, the, the being faultless, being perfect, is something that keeps coming up again and again. At the same time, the jinnah is also a being worthy of worship. And uh, the entire uh, ritualistic part that the Jains continue to practice even today, the, the jinnah images, the devotional literature, and it's quite a lot to go into. And uh, uh, there's not much that I can discuss here, but uh, there is a vibrant tradition of worshipping the jinnah and uh, the stotras and all uh, qu 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 and this was something that I was just curious to know so I, I thought I'll just quote it uh, uh, how many temples exactly are there in terms of the population ratio and it was interesting even for me to find out that I mean these numbers perhaps uh, require further uh, validation but from the sources that I was able to derive uh, I mean the for every 400, 500 people, there is one Jain temple. And if we compare it with uh, the other numbers, I think the Jains do practice a lot of Kipsik practices within temples. 
Uh, and even there are certain sects which are an iconic, so, so those uh, are perhaps uh, not counted. Moving further, there is also a sense of revelation, and the Tirthankara gives those courses to disciples who are known as Ganadharas in a divine assembly hall, Samava Sharana. The disciples then codify the teachings into various scriptures, which come to be known as canons, agamas, and these are further divided into Chuvil and so on. Later Jain Acharyas composed texts which are based on those arguments, so post-canonical Jain literature. And yeah, so, so with this, I've just tried to uh, portray and draw some of the arguments that go against Thism as well as that argue for some Thistic elements. And with this, what we get is something like this. So the jinna or the Tirthankara is a perfect being, Nirdosha, is free from imperfection. He is a Sarvagya and he is free from nuisance. He has a beginning, Sadi, Upaya Siddha, and it's not possible to be beginningless. And there is no interaction with the universe. So that, um, in terms of uh, creation, reward, punishment, all such things are not present uh, for, for, for the Jainas. The jinna is also a uh, Vita Raga, not non-attached, and attachment to one love are all considered to be uh, negative. Uh, the jinna is also an authoritative teacher, and he is something that is not unauthoritative. He is also worthy of worship, and there could be some more uh, properties that perhaps could be added here. These were just some which I could uh, derive. And lastly, um, what implications does this have? Well. So one of the problems that has uh, grappled, I mean, philosophers of religion throughout history is the problem of evil. And the standard argument goes something like this. I won't read it out. Everyone is perhaps familiar, but I'll just try to uh, draw attention to one of the premise, and which is this. So if God is morally perfect, then God has the desire to eliminate all evil. Now, the Jainas reject that there is no desire in the context of God, and therefore the subsequent conclusions that are derived from this uh, do not follow. And therefore, uh, there is no desire as such for the God to eliminate evil, even though he is consciously aware of them, or maybe uh, passively aware of all the evils that, that are existing today, uh, because he is omniscient. Still, since desire is absent, uh, perhaps uh, evil is explained via certain other mechanisms like karma and agency of the jiva, and so on and so forth. And uh, the second set of questions that this conference was perhaps um, uh, uh, interested in and uh, all about consciousness. So uh, again, since the God is not the creator of the universe, for the Jainas, consciousness is not an uh, emergent property. If consciousness doesn't emerge, it means they postulate the existence of a substance, reincarnation, jiva, with consciousness since beginning of time. And perhaps this is why, uh, I mean, not just the Jaina, but I think across Indian philosophy, the hard problem of consciousness was never seriously uh, there, maybe because uh, the substratum continues via reincarnation and transmigration and so on and so forth. But uh, this was something that uh, could also be explored further. And with this, I'll just uh, stop. Thank you. Yeah, uh, thank you very much for that presentation. I, I had a question about um, uh, the last item on, on your description on, on the table. Mm -hmm. God is worthy of worship. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, clearly, empirically, that's true. As in, as you pointed out, Jains have plenty of temples and and, and engage in worship. Um, I I was more curious about the philosophical arguments for worthiness of worship because mm -hmm. it's well known in religious studies that philosophical concepts don't necessarily match with mm -hmm. with with uh, practice, and so. Would you be able to elaborate uh, on this point philosophically? What's the argument for worthiness of worship yep. when there is an absence of grace? Yeah. So for, for them, the jinnah, uh, I, I did mention something like the jinnah is a moral exemplar. 
And that is something that kind of invoke uh, the element that any subject who comes to worship the jinnah comes with an attitude that I want to become a jinnah. And it is this openness of any individual who can eventually become a jinnah that perhaps motivates uh, the sansari mundane being to keep coming and visiting and worship the jinnah. And, um, and there, there have been such elements that are present even in philosophical texts. So the after pariksha that I, I was, I'm trying to uh, refer to, it begins with particularly this uh, statement that I, uh, like Vidyanandan is referring to another, his, one of his predecessors, says that I worship the jinnah because he is uh, free from the karmas, because he is sarvagya, uh, he is omniscient, and because he is the promulgator on the path to liberation, so moksha marga uh, upadeshaka. And it's mainly this element that since he teaches, since there is a divine revelation that happens that he becomes worthy of worship. And his teachings, uh, like philosophers defend it via logic and argumentation and the Jain philosophical position, which is coming from, from his teachings, but it's defended in, in a philosophical way. But that also lends uh, worthiness. So, and, and worship is essentially a, then a form of emulation. Yes, I think. Yeah. Um, yeah, thank you, Janesh. Thank you so much for this really great talk. I wanted to ask about the philosophical basis for claiming that uh, the God is a perfect being. So, with um, modification. So, um, <clears throat> there, are like two, there are two different ways you can talk about something being a perfect being. You can talk about it being sort of like the, the best possible exemplar of, or example of its kind. Um, but then you can sort of zoom out and sort of ask questions about which kind of thing is better to be than something else, right? Um, so uh, Edward Wieranga has a 2011 paper about this, if you're interested. And um, so, it, so he says, like, for example, like, you could be the best, like, the, the best or most perfect example of a corruptible thing, but it's better to be an incorruptible thing, for mm -hmm. example. And so, like, the, the perfect, so, like, we can talk about a perfect corruptible thing, maybe, but um, like the perfect horse or the perfect right, like, but we, but it, it's better to be an incorruptible thing. And if we're talking about a perfect being, simply like earth, he argues that's the kind of thing we have in mind. Yeah. So then, if if we look at the some of the attributes that that the god is missing, like compassion or right, the fact that it, it lacks the desire to do anything but evil, on what philosophical basis can we argue that it is the perfect being in sort of the ultimate sense? Uh -huh. So, um, well, uh, the idea of perfection uh, uh, could be uh, perhaps revisited and the way the Jainas think of it is that given their uh, worldview and the metaphysics that the individual is in a beginningless state of ignorance and so on, and the goal is to uh, eliminate uh, all, all the imperfections. So, so those imperfections are the ones that are targeted and once they are eliminated completely and the one who reaches to the uh, other end of the journey is considered to be a perfect being. And the other attributes which could have made him perfect, uh, they, they argue that they are not required. So as I said that Vidyanandan argues that it's not even possible to be a beginningless supreme being. So he argues that, well, uh, we just want the jinnah to be having a beginning. And to him have no beginning, perhaps uh, so he then goes into the uh, arguments which deny creatorship and all. Because to have a beginningless entity is to assume creatorship and so on. So, so he then denies creatorship, which helps him to deny beginninglessness and so on. So, so can I just clarify? So then, it, is it maybe more like a maximal God thesis? I think so. Okay. I I have uh, read a little bit about it, but I haven't. I still have to explore that. Yeah. Yeah. Ah, minus sort of clarification. I wonder if I missed it. So you said the same Tirthankaras are the equivalent of God who are perfect beings, right? 
So do they attain perfection while they are alive or are they otherwise thought of? I mean, is it some, the equivalent of Jivan Mukti or is it something yeah. else? Thought? So in the state of embodiment, they do attain perfection, but since the body is still present, they are not perfectly perfect. So it is only when they become disembodied like the Siddhas, mm -hmm. uh, who are no longer having the body and some of the residual of karma that were remaining. Uh, but still, uh, psych, uh, like spiritually, uh, the perfection is attained while one is living here in an embodied state. So the Arhantas or the Jinnas or the Tirthankaras, they are all in an embodied state and yet they are with omniscience. They are nirdosha, they are free from raga, dresha, etc. and so on. So do they eternally persist eternally after disembodiment? Yeah. So after disembodiment, they continue to persist eternally. No, so a question. You, you said that the, the terms Nastika and Astika should be revisited. So what's, what's alternative? What do you what's alternative categories would you suggest? Uh, so this is something that I um, I haven't come across much, but I think one of the introductions to Sarva Darshana Sangra, I don't remember the author. He tries to show that there could be perhaps another way to distinguish schools of Indian philosophy. One could be uh, exegetical schools, the other could be rationalist, and one more could be perhaps, uh, I think there's another category that he brings into discussion. But the heterodox orthodox, I mean, their Krishna completely just uh, blows it away. And he says, like, I mean, in what sense is Sankhya uh, 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 a Vedic school? In what sense? Um, is uh, Nanyaika and Vaisheshika, given their realism and common sense and, and, and the entire worldview, in what sense are they committed to the teachings of the Upanishads and the um, uh, earlier Vedic uh, scriptures? So, Daya Krishna's argument, uh, and he talks about this in, in a very detailed way in his three myths of Indian philosophy and three conceptions of Indian philosophy. So uh, I am just trying to add to that, but I think yeah, we, these notions need to be revisited because we are like when I look at Jain account of theism and atheism, uh, I don't find it adequate to label it as either theistic or atheist. So. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, thanks so much. I was wondering uh, if you could clarify or revisit the notion of omniscience. There were in two senses. One was almost the disposition to know everything after a move in that thing, where you have the potential to know, versus almost the more hagiographic knowing everything all at once. Uh -huh. um, where do those different uses come up, and is that an accurate kind of representation? Of okay. Maybe I I might have given you an impression that these are two different senses of omission, but perhaps they aren't uh, there in the text. So omniscience for the Jainas are, is like a, a full realization of the soul's potential. So each soul has a potential omniscience, but it's only via this uh, entire uh, journey of uh, eliminating all the doshas and the imperfections and the karmic wills that one eventually reaches a state where one is no longer under the wheel of ignorance and one realizes the full potential which is uh, uh, ananta jnana uh, for omniscience. So, and it's uh, very uh, strongly uh, defended by perhaps all then philosophers to write a text in epistemology. So any, any given then text in epistemology and logic will include a proof for omniscience in some or the other way. And this was just one of the instances that I tried to discuss over here, but omniscience is considered to be knowledge of literally everything past, present, and future. And this is something also important for them because the entire uh, philosophy kind of depends on the teachings of the jinnah. And if uh, the jinnah is ignorant or not omniscient, then the validity of the scriptural tradition, etc. comes into question. Thank you for this talk. Um, very good. Um, just for my clarification, um, 
you go two positions, right? A theistic and a non theistic position. So each position has a kind of concept of God, right? With different attributes. And the, the non theistic position kind of dismantles God through those attributes, and the theistic kind of tradition supports the idea. So I'm wondering um, is there two concepts of God within the tradition? And uh, or is there and or is there one concept and they argue over the attributes or they argue to to two different concepts of God with different attributes? How does that work? Okay. So uh, it's one tradition, and I think all the Jains, Digambara, Shatambara, and the four of six, they are unanimous when it comes to what God is and what is the nature of a jinna and a tantana. So I'm sorry if I have not have given that impression, but it's one tradition and one view, and both the attributes are simultaneously either argued for or against. Uh, yeah, it's just a little question about, um, you know, you mentioned the uh, Sirat at one point, and uh, there was the thought that, you know, um, God exists, doesn't exist, you know, he either is or is not, and then, and maybe for, you know. Uh, but, you know, if I understand this right, there's, there's other options, maybe not, mm -hmm. you know, and then possible combinations. We usually look to for, uh, you know, with a, with a larger set of options. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I'm just wondering, is it in this context, or do you want that there's only the three options, or do you want to... You know, um, yeah. you want to say there are more options. So, we should, you think, you know. so I haven't tried to bring the Bhangi into discussion over here, but I can uh, uh, offer a brief response to this question. So, uh, the fourth Bhanga, uh, which considers uh, the position that it's neither or something on those lines, uh, something on the lines of Achintya. Or uh, Anirvachaniya uh, Avaktavya is the term that the Jaina use. I think there is some confusion in the ongoing scholarship on the subject. So, what Jainas define Avaktavya as is not that it is uh, not possible for two mutually contradictory properties to exist simultaneously. What they talk about Avaktavya is uh, that it's not possible to assert uh, those simultaneously. So their concept of avaktavya or uh, the concept of um, the fourth bhanga is not that it's neither which Nagarjuna or someone like um, any any such uh, logic ends up with, but it's like inclusive of both, but it's the simultaneous non-assertion that they emphasize instead of simultaneous non-possibility. Anything else? So, yes. sorry, I, I didn't want to take other people's time. I didn't see class to ask me questions. Sorry, thank you so much for your talk. It was really, really good. Um, I, I don't know, like, can you think about this? So, please, I'm just going to throw right Abrahamic perspective. So, forgive me. So, you can be a perfect being without having, like, without being loving, without being compassionate. There's no moral sense in which uh, God is a perfect being. Um, like, Maybe not for the others, but he himself is morally perfect. Okay. And uh, yeah, but when it comes to like being perfect for others or helping others to reach that state, it's only the teachings that he has. I mean, that he has offered. Apart from that, he doesn't interact or doesn't even perhaps listen. <laughs> yeah, he is weak rather. That is what they say. So. It doesn't matter whether someone worships a jinnah or doesn't. Uh, it's up to the individual. And uh, the jinnah is passionless. The jinnah doesn't care uh, as such. Thank you. Thank you.